Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon, and welcome to another Monticello live stream. My name is Brandon Dillard, and I'm the manager of historic interpretation at this historic site, plantation, and the home of Thomas Jefferson. Long before Thomas Jefferson was born at Monticello, and long before English colonists began cutting down the forest or enslaving Africans for tobacco production, this land that later became known as Virginia in the wake of that settler colonialism was known by many other names. For millennia, these areas in central Virginia were cared for and stewarded by indigenous peoples of the Americas. Here in and around Albemarle County, the Monacan nation thrived for centuries prior to European incursion and mound building cultures left wonders that confounded these European settlers. On early English maps, we can see anglicized spellings of names like Saponi, Tutelo, and Monahoic, and further from Monticello, tribal names like Matapanai, Cherenhaka, Nottaway, Chickahominy, Rappahannock, Nansaman, Patawamek, Pamunkey, and many more, representative of the polities, cultures, and places, so named by speakers of languages as diverse as the peoples themselves, falling into Iroquoian, Algonquian, and Siouan language families. The impact of European colonization cannot be overstated in its devastating effects on the people and the land. But the Monacan Nation remains in Virginia today, as do 10 other state-recognized tribes and hundreds more throughout the United States and the Americas. And of course, millions of Native people and descendants of Native people are citizens of this country. Native Americans living in the Americas today and the indigenous ancestors who came before all exemplify the strength of human resilience and the power of tradition and culture. As with most of the history at Monticello, these early histories of unceded lands and colonial conflicts are representative of a broader story of American history and the legacies we experience today. For the 11 state recognized tribes of Virginia, for the thousands of Virginians with indigenous heritage, and for the hundreds of Native American nations that exist throughout North and South America, and for all of us, these early histories of colonization, resistance, and persistence can shed light on how our world came to be. We are exceptionally grateful to be joined today by Heather Briegel. Heather is a citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and first line descendant of Stockbridge Muncie. She is a graduate of Madonna University in Michigan and holds a Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts in US history. Inspired by a trip to Wounded Knee, South Dakota, a passion for Native American history was born. She has spoken for numerous groups, including the University of Michigan, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and the College of the Menominee Nation. She has spoken at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh for Indigenous Peoples Day in 2017, and Heather also opened and spoke at the Women's March Anniversary in Lansing, Michigan in January 2018. She also spoke at the first ever Indigenous Peoples March in Washington, D.C. in January of 2019, and that summer in 2019, virtually in 2020 and in 2021. She spoke at the Crazy Horse Memorial and Museum in Custer, South Dakota for their Talking Circle series. She has also become the, quote, accidental activist and speaks to different groups about intergenerational racism and trauma and helps to bring awareness to our environment, the fight for clean water and other issues in the Native community. A curiosity of her own heritage led her to Wisconsin, where she has researched the history of Native American tribes in the area. She is the former Director of Cultural Affairs for the Stockbridge Muncie Community and now serves as the Director of Education for Forge Project. In addition to that, she also currently travels and speaks on Native American history, including policy and activism. So welcome, Heather, and thank you for speaking to our audience today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited, um, mainly because in undergrad, I wrote my thesis on Thomas Jefferson, so I'm very stoked to be uh, talking today at Monticello. Well, thank you for being here. We're excited to have you as well. So, uh, but, you know, before we get into talking about Thomas Jefferson, would you would you mind telling the audience a bit more about uh, the Ford Pro Forge Project? Yeah, Forge Project. I'm very excited to talk about that. So Forge Project is a new initiative here in the Mahikanatuck River Valley, um, you know, it is the Hudson River Valley. And um, what it is, is it's an organization that provides several different things. There is a fellowship, which is for uh, indigenous movers and shakers in their communities, whether they're working in land justice, climate justice, um, raising awareness on different issues in Indian country, 
we understand that that work can be hard and and to do that full time is not always easy so we provide a fellowship where you can do that work we also work on supporting and raising the awareness of contemporary indigenous artists because they do not get the same clout as non-indigenous artists so we want to make sure that we are raising that capital and that awareness and so um, we have an art collection, which is a lending and learning collection. So that is something that we have. And there's, you know, we want to focus on issues in land back, MMIW, which is Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, um, raising um, historical awareness of Indigenous people and working broadly across Indian country. So there's a lot of good work that Forge is doing. That's great. And, and we're already uh, getting some questions from our audience. Uh, Chester is curious if you could talk a little bit about Stockbridge Muncie. Um, the Stockbridge Muncie, yeah, absolutely. Stockbridge Muncie community, um, you also know as Mohican Nation. They are the Mohicans. So when James Fenmore Cooper wrote Last of the Mohicans, he was lying um, because the Mohicans still exist. Um, they were here uh, in the lower Hudson River Valley parts of Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Um, and now their seat of government is located in Boulder, Wisconsin. And thank you for that. Yeah. So, okay, you started it by talking about your thesis on Jefferson. We can switch gears and, and jump into the history of this site. Um, and, you know, we're here at Monticello. And Thomas Jefferson, his whole world, his upbringing, uh, you know, it's part of the colonization of Virginia, the English colonization of Virginia. And as such, it's, it's necessarily entangled with the lives of Native Americans around him. And, you know, throughout the course of Jefferson's long life, he wrote so many things uh, about pretty much everything. And of course, he corresponded with and wrote about many indigenous people. So, uh, you know, and you told me when we talked before that you've, you've been fascinated in this for a long time and interested in Jefferson for a long time. So, so what can we learn from this? What can we learn about European colonial attitudes? What can we learn about Jefferson and, and what lessons can we take away from that? Well, I think first and foremost, when we're talking about historical figures such as Thomas Jefferson, we need to take the magic and the myth out of it, right? I am so tired of people thinking, you know, oh, these are great, extraordinary people. They were ordinary people like you and I, who were in extraordinary circumstances, but they were still people at the end of the day who made decisions that were in their benefit and not for the benefit of the masses, right? So when we think about Thomas Jefferson in terms of his upbringing, his very privileged upbringing, right? He was a white man in colonial Virginia, um, he came from money. He married money. He, um, you know, tore down and rebuilt Monticello how many times? So that was definitely from a place of privilege. So I think it's important to to first think about how he wielded that privilege in not necessarily a way that was beneficial to a lot of people. It only benefited wealthy white landowners. It didn't benefit the indigenous people who inhabited the areas where Monticello is now built. It didn't benefit the enslaved people who worked at Monticello. It didn't uh, benefit women in general. So I think it's important to first take the man out of the myth and look at those, um, those not so good parts of history that he was part of. And, you know, his relations with indigenous people were not that great as well. His attitudes towards indigenous people when he was president was, were not that great. Um, he, you know, wrote all men are created equal, but he forgot to put in all wealthy white men are created equal. You know, that's the part that he really should have said because that's the part it really only benefited. There's, there's so much in what you just said that we're going to keep getting into, which is great, right? And it's, it's, okay. a lot of, it's a lot of what we do at Monticello. You know, we want to try and encourage people to have real conversations about history, which means recognizing that it's messy and there are a lot of hard aspects of that history, as well as aspects that we can talk about in a celebratory way. And to really get the full picture, we have to put it all together. And I think that uh, one of the things you said that's so true about Jefferson that uh, is fascinating for us is that here's a guy who wrote about, you know, all people being free and equal his entire life and wrote about how dangerous aristocracy was because he was born rich enough. 
to write about how dangerous aristocracy was, uh, which is not usually discussed about like the way that he lived his life or the privileges to use your word that he was born into. And, you know, as part of that, he definitely, uh, you know, he wrote a lot about his interest in the world, his study of the world, you know, in this way, Jefferson, uh, he, he represents the time, you know, this, this enlightenment ideology of people who are studying science and nature, which is very much a Euro-American construct. Uh, but as part of that, he's actually, he's studying native people and he's, he's compiling things like language materials. And one of the things that uh, visitors to Monticello are often surprised to learn is that he also oversaw the excavation of a burial mound near his home. Uh, and many people, when talking about this, they talk about it uh, in this laudable way as Jefferson being uh, a founder of North American archaeology. But let's talk for a minute about how that strikes you uh, and what you think of when uh, you hear that Jefferson oversaw the excavation of a burial mound. I feel like I'm going to make a lot of people mad. Um, <laughs> um, so you think about it in terms of overseeing that excavation, an excavation that should have not happened, right? You don't go and excavate the cemetery down the road. You don't go and, oh my gosh, if we had an excavation at Arlington, people would like lose their spit, seriously. Why is it okay and why is it revered that he, that he oversaw this excavation of, you know, they're not my ancestors, but they are ancestors who should have stayed in the ground when, but then doing it in, in, a, in a way of learning, like science, portraying it that way. There's a reason where, why, when you are doing a depiction of indigenous people in a natural history museum, why that's problematic, right? There's a reason because we're people, we're not objects, we're not um figures of myth we're not you know we're not fossils we're people so he yes he celebrated and reviewed learning i think learning is super important as well and i'm totally down with that but he did it in such a way that it really boiled the native american down the indigenous person down to an object to an animal to to something to be studied because we're different. And, you know, I remember even being a young child and going to museums. And when I would see, like, you know, go to the Egyptian section of the of the museums and seeing like the mummies there and really thinking there's something fundamentally wrong with that. Like, why would you unbury somebody and put them in a museum? I thought when you bury somebody, and this is like me nine, 10 years old going, I thought if you bury somebody, they're like in the ground forever. Right. That's where they should be, because that's the respectful thing. You know, you have ceremony, you bury your loved one and you move on. You don't expect them to then be buried up years later. And Jeff or anybody doing that. I mean, there are good archaeologists in the world and there are archaeologists who understand you don't dig up bones, particularly human bones. But Jefferson, yeah, he did it in a way that really just boiled us down to animals and that's that's not a good thing you started it by saying you're afraid you're gonna make people mad uh hopefully that doesn't happen and we we do invite people to listen to all different perspectives of conversations sometimes that are uncomfortable and, and we think that's a good thing that that yes. helps us better understand it but i want to invite you uh to pull on a thread of something that you just mentioned there for our audience um, because I'm willing to bet that people would be interested in hearing uh, more about when you said, you know, you visited museums and uh, Native American people are, are categorized with natural history and like what that means. So can you talk just a little bit more about the frequency with which that occurs and the ways in which American memory constructs, uh, public memory particularly is written by mostly white men. Uh, categorizes indigenous people uh, monoculturally and also in terms of uh, you know natural specimens. Yeah, so that's really it's really interesting to to think about that. Um, I having worked in the museum world as well and having consulted on various exhibitions of indigenous representation in museums, it's it's a fine line between appreciating the culture and learning about it 
and classifying it as something that's foreign because it's not right. We were the first peoples on this continent. We, um, uh, a great Lakota artist, John Trudell, you know, he has a quote that I really, really love. And it's like, we're not just the Native Americans, we're the human beings because we're older than that concept. So we've been here since the beginning of time. And so if you think about it in terms of that, so there's a lot of, um, I'm trying to think of how I want to phrase this. When, when I go to a natural history museum, which I'm close to New York City now, I do plan on going to the museum that is there because I just really want to see it. I go in and I expect to learn about natural history. I expect to learn about the plants and the animals and the landscape and things like that. What I don't expect to learn about is people because people in any way, shape or form don't belong in a natural history museum, right? If you want to learn about the history of the American Indian, the indigenous people, you need, they need to be portrayed in a way where they're not portrayed as, as animals, as creatures of myth, right? Because natural history museums tend to have uh, exhibitions and exhibits where things are extinct. They're no longer there. We are still here, right? I am in a, a, a live, breathing, talking citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. So the, my nation still exists. My people still exist, um, along with other 574 federally recognized tribes here in the United States. So we don't go, we don't belong in natural history museums because we're still around, right? And people still need to learn from us and learn about us. And if you are to do some sort of exhibition in a natural history museum, you've got to do it in a very careful way where you're not coming off as saying the indigenous person is extinct. And I think when you think about the time period that Thomas Jefferson was living in, it kind of almost felt like that, right? Because indigenous people started dying off in droves because of disease that was coming in, because of war, because their lands were being invaded. So to him, he probably really did think he was excavating extinct natural history where years later, we know that that's just not the case and it was inappropriate to do in the first place. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And I think that um, there's just so many different ways in which this history like reasserts itself. Uh, and so I'm going to dig into a very concrete one. Um, you know, Jefferson, he's best known for writing the American Declaration of Independence. Uh, and, you know, this document, it's, it's largely held up for its endorsement of freedom and equality, goals of self-governments. But in the Declaration, uh, Jefferson included as one of his grievances uh, against King George, uh, and I'm going to read this verbatim. So fair warning for the audience, the language that I'm going to use here uh, is not language that should be used today, but I think it's necessary to give full insight. So, quote, he endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose warfare is an indistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions, end quote. You know, my, in my experience here at Monticello, most white Americans are unfamiliar with this clause in the Declaration. Uh, but in my experience, that is not the case for most Native people throughout the United States. Uh, so we just talked for a couple of minutes about his word choices and about what this clause reveals uh, to us today. Yeah, so I'm actually wearing a t-shirt that says Merciless Indian Savages on it, and it quotes the Declaration of Independence. I will plug it. You can get it at ntvs.com. It's designed by Stephen Paul Judd, um, Indigenous-owned company, Indigenous artists. Um, so I did a lot of reading and writing on person when I was in college because my name is Heather and I have a really unhealthy obsession with Thomas Jefferson. I admit this. <laughs> First step in recovery is to admit you have a problem. So um, my, I, you know, did a lot about it and I will say I was aware of it, but I was very naive to the actual meanings of it as until I started to dive deeper into to what he was talking about. And so, of course, you know, when I talk about the Declaration of Independence, I refer to it as the greatest breakup letter of all time. I mean, we're just, you know, like, sorry, it's not you, it's us, you know, we're going to move on, it's going to be cool, there'll be some hard feelings, but we'll make it through it together. And so when you get to listing all the grievances 
no, like merciless Indian savages. We're the ones who are, you know, evil, and we're the ones who, um, I mean, merciless. We're awful. He, I mean, he paints us in a light that we're these barbarians and that we're doing something wrong. When all in fact, all along, what we're trying to do is survive. We are trying to survive the barbaric actions of the colonists, right? Encroaching in on our lands, kidnapping our women, killing our men. Like, but if you look throughout history and not just in the Declaration of Independence, indigenous people are always painted as the bully. We're always painted as the aggressor. We're never painted, and I don't want to say indigenous people are victims because we're very resilient, you know? You knock us down, we get back up and we come back stronger because we're still here. But we're always looked at as the aggressor and it's very sad when that's the history that's given, you know? And for people to not know that this particular phrase is in the Declaration of Independence is a huge disservice to Jefferson in, in all of its bad context, but also to the document itself and to the founding of the country. It's a disservice to all of that because you need to know everything. You need to know every detail in order to understand what he was meaning by those words and then be able to deconstruct what was going on, unlearn the myth and learn something true. And yes. then you buy a t-shirt with it and you take the phrase back. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it really is fascinating that, uh, you know, these documents, these founding documents are quoted all the time, but how infrequently people actually read them in their entirety, uh, which, you know, I'm not blaming people for that. I'm guilty of that, too. If I didn't have a job at Monticello, I probably wouldn't have regularly read the Declaration as frequently as I do. And that's right? fair. That's yeah. totally fair. <laughs> but I think that you're absolutely right. Uh, familiarizing ourselves more with them in their entirety gives us better insight. Uh, so thank you for that. Absolutely. And, so this is part of it, too, that, that we talked a little bit about in advance of this. But, you know, Jefferson, while president, he's often uh, cited as being primarily responsible for the Louisiana Purchase. And in many ways, he had a, a great hand in that. And American public memory often throughout the past couple of hundred years describes this as a positive good for the country. It's a great thing to be celebrated. But the Louisiana Purchase, it's going to profoundly impact hundreds of indigenous nations, millions of people for, for generations west of the Mississippi. And, you know, they're not even considered uh, when the exchange takes place between France and the United States. You know, it's not even discussed, really. Uh, and so, you know, let's talk just a little bit about the results of the Louisiana Purchase on indigenous people in the West and, and what that did for many nations. Yeah, so we we clearly were not consulted in that purchase, right? Because um, why would we be? We were just the people who inhabited that huge, you know, millions of acreage that goes from Louisiana all the way up um, west of the Mississippi. Um, and it's just, you know, why consult us? And the fact that Jefferson did it before it was even legal for him to do it, <laughs> like he purchased it, then went to Congress and got a bill passed. So that's a whole other story. But um, yeah, so what the Louisiana Purchase did in, in my research and in my interpretation of things is it opened the door to removal. So removal wasn't passed until 1830, but tribes had been slowly being pushed off their lands in the east, as we know, further west to um, what is now the state of Oklahoma. And so with the Louisiana Purchase happening, it opens up more space for settlement. But now Jefferson's got another problem he has to deal with, right? Because there's all these indigenous people who were living there. And you've already got people who um, are mad. They had fought, you know, with the colonists during the American Revolution. They thought, you know, hey, if we're loyal and we're helpful and we, you know, help throw off the, the yoke of the British government, we'll be able to have at least a small piece of land for us, right? Where the United States is going to work with us. And that didn't happen. You know, both of the tribes that I consider my home tribes, the Oneida and the Stockbridge Muncie, both fought on the side of the colonists and then were removed from their land. And then, so 
you've got that happening. You've got other tribes being moved as well. And now the the first problem to solve was what do we do with the tribes in the east? Well, we move them. We keep moving them west. Then Jefferson purchases this huge area of land where there are more indigenous people. What do we do with them there? He already starts the process of removal before Jackson even gets into office. I mean, and, and that's President Andrew Jackson, who we all know is a great friend to indigenous people. And um, so, you know, Jackson basically just finishes what Jefferson started because Jefferson's relationship with indigenous people is so complicated in terms of he recognizes us as sovereign nations but also in the same breath says that we have to assimilate into this new American society. Our blood is to mix with their blood until our blood no longer exists, that we're just absorbed. And reading those words is extremely powerful when you think about that land that he purchases because it all boils, everything in this country boils down to land. Who owns it? Who wants it? Who has it? And at that moment, it was the indigenous people who had it. And now we've got this Indian problem, quote, that we have to solve. And so what do we do? We keep pushing people westward. We continuously, you know, find um, reasons to fight with them. We find ways to put indigenous nations into debt. He, Jefferson was very good at setting up trade posts where indigenous nations who were forced into these smaller areas of land would have to go to these trade posts to get their goods, they wouldn't be able to pay. So how did he accept payment? You had to give up your land. And so getting that Louisiana purchase just made it all more easier for the United States to continue to expand westward because of manifest destiny and city upon a hill. Um, so how are we going to get that land? We're going to force them off. We're going to put them into debt and we're going to take it. And that's just, and that, that is the American way. <laughs> you, you talked a, a good bit there about Jefferson's uh, early ideas around this. And just for our audience, uh, you know, we do uh, in the United States often, you know, Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, as the administrations in power during uh, the primary removal that is most talked about in public schools and throughout education, uh, the Trail of Tears and the removal of the Southeastern tribes. Uh, but Jefferson was talking about this well before, uh, and he predicted, he even advocated for this policy. And to uh, look at some of those um, ideas of Jefferson's that Heather just talked about, uh, you know, you can, you can check out the link that we'll throw up in our comments section here. But he wrote in a letter in 1803 to William Henry Harrison, quote, they will in time either incorporate with us as citizens of the United States or remove beyond the Mississippi, uh, end quote, which clearly um, underscores everything Heather just said about how the Louisiana Purchase fed into removal policies. There's another aspect of, of what happens uh, with <laughs> westward expansion uh, and, of course, the Lewis and Clark expedition into the West. Uh, and, and one of the things at Monticello that often surprises people uh, is when you walk into the front room of the mansion uh, at Monticello, the, you're, you're struck by how many American Indian objects surround you in this space. Uh, and <laughs> most of them uh, look like items that were sent back from the Northern Plains, the Great Plains. You know, they're, they're bison uh, on, the, on the walls or bison skins on the walls. And uh, people were surprised by that. But of course, it it tells us a little bit about Jefferson, also uh, the idea of collection and harkens back a little bit to something you were talking about in the beginning, which has to do with the creation of museums. So can you, can you talk just for a minute about like the collection, what that meant, uh, those kinds of gifts and what that meant for the Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, and of course uh, the expedition that could never have happened at all had it not been for uh, a young woman who probably did most of the diplomatic communications along the way, Sacagawea. So just talk about that for a moment, if you would. Yeah, just want to give a shout out to Sacagawea. She could, <laughs> these men could not have done it without her. Girlfriend knew her way around the area. She was uh, fluent in several different indigenous languages. So, um, you know, shout out to her and all of her hard work. 
But yeah, so it's interesting when I was thinking about the objects that are at Monticello, um, and I know some of them are actually recreations because where did the objects go? We don't know. Um, but it's, you know, clearly in the time of Jefferson's life, there was no context given to said objects. So they would just probably be in the home and he would use them as conversational pieces or um, just showing off his collections of what he had. What I think is important to put into context is these probably would have been gifts that were given to Lewis and Clark along the way because um, giving gifts is very much something that is an indigenous thing to do. You know, you welcome somebody into your community and, you know, when they leave, you you give them something uh, to remember you by or perhaps in the case of the buffalo hides or things that keep warm, keep safe. This will help you in some way, shape or form. So that's very much um a very indigenous thing to do. Not necessarily sure that Jefferson would have interpreted it that way, but it's also then important to put those things into context and to place them into history and the importance of said items, um, you know, that the collection might have. But also understanding too, depending on what mood either one of those explorers were in, the objects might've just been taken. You know, you might have seen a, a peace pipe laying down and you're like, well, that looks cool and just taken it without knowing the story behind that, the the piece, the history behind that piece, um, the ceremony that is involved in that piece and, you know, things that are in that. So it's important to take those things into context. You know, Jefferson probably would not have. He would have looked at them as gifts to him for being really great and and look what these people brought back to me and and all of that so it is interesting to think about um those objects at monticello because number one i don't think a lot of people would even make the leap from thomas jefferson to native americans right you think thomas jefferson you think declaration of independence you think you know ambassador of france you think of all those other things you don't think of his relation to indigenous nations or lack thereof of relation to indigenous nations. So I think, you know, it's it's it would be pretty interesting to see those objects when you first walk in. Even in his time with visitors coming to Monticello, they would have been like, what? Because at this time, you know, thinking in his life period, there weren't a lot of native nations or a lot of people of indigenous ancestry left in Virginia. A lot of people had been wiped out by disease and war. So it would have been something unusual for other you know, visitors to come and see when they were there at the same time. And I will say for our audience real quick, I'll, I'll, I'll quote you and say, I'll give a shout out real quick to the artists who are responsible for the recreated items that are in the entrance hall. Uh, they were made in 2003 to commemorate the bicentennial of uh, the Corps of Discovery expedition into the West. And they were primarily made by students at United Tribes Technical College in Bismarck uh, under the direction of a hunk Papa Lakota named Butch Thunderhawk. Uh, and they've been at Monticello now for almost 20 years um, on display. And they do uh, invite great conversation with visitors because as you said, Heather, people, uh, many visitors to the site, they don't, they don't make that connection. Right. And I'm gonna jump to a, a specific thing here. Uh, okay. But you started early by talking about the mythology of the founders, you know, this great myth of, of putting these guys on a pedestal. Uh, and I talk about this uh, on a lot of tours with visitors to Monticello that, you know, in, in American public memory, we really like to put our founding figures on pedestals, like really like to do that. And in so doing, dehumanize them. Mount Rushmore, is the largest pedestal that I have ever seen, uh, where literally, uh, you know, you've got these guys like deified and this, this just giant form. Uh, but, but Mount Rushmore, you know, it might be one of the most symbolic, uh, and of course, physical reminder of U S policies and native lands. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's symbolic of this deification of the founding figures that frankly makes teaching, uh, history challenging because people uh, often are oppositional to having conversations about people being human beings, uh, which, is, which is hard. But more importantly, perhaps, for this conversation is that from the perspectives of, of so many people in the West and several native nations in the West, this sculpture is a desecration of the sacred Black Hills. Uh, 
So can you just talk for a minute about that, about Mount Rushmore, you know, about Fort Laramie? Uh, just just tell a little bit uh, about the history for our audience. Yeah, I, um, I gave a talk this summer um, at the Crazy Horse Memorial, which is way more impressive anyways. It's really big. It's very cool. Um, <laughs> but um, I gave a talk there this summer talking about um, how the Black Hills need to be returned to the Lakota people. And so that goes back to the Treaty of Fort Laramie, the 1868 treaty, because there were two. This one is specifically the 1868 treaty. And in that treaty, the Black Hills were part of the Great Sioux Reservation. Um, and Sioux is a uh, French word, means snake. It's what the Ojibwe called the Lakota. So um, it's because they didn't like each other. And so I, um, I try to refer to it as Lakota, but it's written in the treaties as the Great Sioux Nation. And the Great Sioux Reservation. So, um, it you know, a lot of that area of North and South Dakota was part of that reservation, and the Black Hills were part of that. The Black Hills are sacred to the Lakota people because that is where they believe that the Great Spirit resides. Um, that's where you went on your vision quests on for different ceremony um, to you know become a woman, become a man, you know, become a warrior. You did all sorts of different things. And the Black Hills were were home to a lot of that. Um, in 1874, a man by the name of George Armstrong Custer led an expedition into the Black Hills and they found gold. Well, now that they have found gold, these Indians can't be having these hills anymore. Like we, we got to take it and we've got to extract the resources. And so uh, through an illegal seizure um, because the Supreme Court later in the 1980s did rule that there was illegal seizure. Um, the Black Hills were taken from the Lakota. The Lakota have sued many times to get the Black Hills back. They were awarded compensation um, because the Supreme Court of the United States said, hey, this was wrong. This was They were illegally taken. You were not properly compensated. And so the Lakota have refused the money because the point is to have the land back. Right. And that's where the land back movement comes into play. But the you know, you've got Mount Rushmore, which, again, in comparison to Crazy Horse, it's very small, it's not <laughs> impressive. We drove up the road to get to Mount Rushmore. We paid. I went in there. I looked at it and I was like, this is it. Can I get my money back? This is not impressive. And I don't know if people realize this. Mount Rushmore is technically not finished. It was, it, they were supposed to be, it was supposed to be like the full figures of the people. So anyway, I digress. But this, you know, Mount Rushmore is then later constructed in the early uh, 19-teens, 1920s. And you look at it and you look who's on it. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Teddy Roosevelt. All good guys on the surface when you look at it. On the surface, when you look at it, great. George Washington, first president of the United States, commander of the Continental Army, leads us through the American Revolution. Yay, freedom. George Washington was also a very heartless slave hunter until his death. There's a really good book out I recommend that you read. It's about Ona Judge, who was a slave of his when he was president. When they were in Philadelphia, she escapes. He never stops looking for her until he's literally dead. Like on his deathbed, he's still looking for her. You've got Abraham Lincoln. He keeps the union together. That's huge. He's fighting slavery, issues the Emancipation Proclamation. But in 1862, he's responsible for the death of 39 Dakota warriors who all they were trying to do was feed their families because the U.S. was not upholding they're part of the agreement and a treaty. You've got Teddy Roosevelt, starts the national park system, preserves this beautiful, preserves beautiful plots of land across the country, amazing spots. I've been to Teddy Roosevelt National Park, it's gorgeous. Teddy Roosevelt says the only good Indian is a dead Indian. What? And then you've got Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States author of the Declaration of Independence, first ambassador to France, forms the University of Virginia. He's all about education. He is also a slaveholder who holds an unconsensual relationship with a slave at his home. And I say it's unconsensual because 
How can she consent? She can't. <laughs> and he also is responsible for the start of Indian removal. But yet we deify these four men. We put them on a mountain that was once called the Six Grandfathers by the Lakota people. And we carve what ultimately is a monument to white supremacy in these sacred hills. And we want people to be okay with that. I don't know, we can't. Mount Rushmore needs to close, needs to be dismantled, however, and the Black Hills need to be returned to the local. And I'm sure I just made a lot of people really mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said at the beginning, uh, our conversations here are meant to uh, provide varied perspectives and to let people hear things that they might not be comfortable with or familiar with, uh, particularly when it uh, broadens conversations about history. You know, one of the things that uh, we repeatedly say at Monticello is uh, that we aim to give uh, a more inclusive understanding of the past, uh, you know, a, a more uh, diverse understanding of the past. And historically, because of these processes of power uh, and supremacy in this country and white supremacy in this country, there are ways in which historical narratives have given this singular story of these white men who you talk about. We can't know objectively what happened in the past because none of us were there. Uh, and anything that we read, no matter who wrote it, has to be filtered through the subjective lens of whoever wrote it. But the one thing that we can do is get as many perspectives as possible. And if we have many perspectives, then maybe we'll have a better understanding about what actually happened. And everything you just said about each of those historical figures is absolutely true uh, in understanding that everything you cited, there is a historical fact. Those things happened, uh, good, good and bad, they did happen. Yes. And, and those are things that uh, might make some people uncomfortable, but uh, history is often uncomfortable and that's right, important. Right. And can I just say something about that? It's okay if you are feeling uncomfortable because if you're feeling uncomfortable, you're thinking and, and you're learning. And that is huge. You're uncomfortable because you know something didn't sound right. Something came off as icky and you're like, how can we make this better? Yeah, I think that's right. And thank you for sharing it. Is there, is there anything else, Heather? Is there anything else you'd like to say? Anything else about this history or any history or legacies that we haven't covered? <sighs> There's so much I could say. Yeah. Um, I also forgot to throw in that Washington was a land speculator. So <laughs> throw that in there as well. But I think it's important to understand that this conversation is not to dog on or speak ill of the good things that happened in history. You know, there there were good things that happened that, you know, Thomas Jefferson was responsible for. I mean, I live in a country where even though it was taken from my ancestors, I can still say it was taken from my ancestors, right? So it's important to note that. But it's also important to note that when you mythologize the founding and the founding fathers, you are doing yourself a disservice because there is so much more to the history that makes it way more interesting than what you learn in schools. And shout out to teachers for doing the best jobs that they can with the limited time that they have. I know you guys are working hard, especially through the pandemic. I appreciate everything you're doing. So it's I encourage people to go out on their own though and learn more. And I think one of the most patriotic things that we can do because Thomas Jefferson was a patriot, I think is question his motives and question his own doings. Yes, he was a man of his times. That's still not an excuse because you can still be a decent person no matter what time period you're living in. And he was not always a decent person. If like maybe 10% of the time he was decent, but I would say about 90% of the time he was not. And this is coming from someone who, oh, my obsession with him is so bad. Like I, I love this very contradictory, contrary, confused person because the more you look at him as a person and see how flawed he is, the more interesting he becomes and the more you actually can learn from his flaws as opposed to putting him on a pedestal. And I also think it's important to, to note and take into consideration that 
the United States is fairly young and when it comes into being a country, like we're just now coming up on our 250th anniversary, right? So that is a very, historically, it's a short amount of time. We're not there yet, but we have the potential to be great if we learn from the past and we understand the mistakes that our founders made, that we have made, and that this country has made as a whole. And again, 250 years, small amount of time. So we, I hate the phrase city upon a hill, but we still have the potential to become that if we learn from the mistakes. We are not a city upon a hill right now, but we could be if we understand the, the greatness and the diversity that we have here. And I really, you know, I don't want to take away from anybody's love of the United States or of Thomas Jefferson. All I want you to do is think. Think about who he was as a person, what this country was actually founded on, and what we have the potential to become if we just learn from each other. Heather, thank you so very much. Uh, the, the last thing I, I would say to any of that is just that uh, we're so grateful that you're here uh, to share these insights with us and that I would invite our audience to listen closely to those last words and find what is to me quite obviously a very hopeful message for a positive future. Uh, and so again, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, we could talk about this for so long. We uh, could. So there's so much that uh, we just barely scratched the surface of. Yeah, maybe we'll have to do a part two. I don't know. I would love that. I would <laughs> love that. And uh, thank you again so very much. Uh, and thank you for joining us on this Monticello live stream. My pleasure. Thank you so much.